right, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast with us. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, this is, again, the first session of our second School Board Academy series of 2022. Uh, so happy you all could join us. I see some repeat names, so that means we have people uh, who just want to come and uh, absorb the information again, uh, you know, memorization and learning is a repeat process. Um, today, we are happy to be joined by uh, Laura Zork and Dr. Karen Hiltz. Uh, Laura Zork is the Director of Education Reform for Freedom Works. Uh, we launched uh, BEST, which is Building Education for Students Together under Laura's leadership, uh, with a mission of igniting a national parent-led movement by building, educating, and mobilizing the largest network of parent activists in the country to advocate for their children's education. Uh, we look to do this through the election of school board members and the passage of policies that align with our vision of expanding educational freedom. Uh, Laura is a proud mom of three Florida public school students from sixth to 11th grade, and prior to joining Freedom Works, uh, Laura served in multiple positions on the parent teacher board of her children's schools and was elected twice president of the Parent Teacher Association and served as a school board member for Indian River County. So thank you, Laura, for joining us. And we are so happy to be with Dr. Karen Hiltz as well. Uh, Dr. Holtz currently sits on the board of Noah Webster Education, uh, Educational Foundation. Uh, formerly, she served in the United States Navy and had a career as a federal acquisition and procurement professional, was professor of business at the undergraduate and graduate levels, and was an elected public school board member in Virginia. She is a speaker and author on education, and she collaborates with local and national groups on education issues advises on education less legislation and policy, and speaks on the dangers of CRT, SEL, and its ideological origins and vocabulary use that is permeated throughout our educational system. So I wanna thank you both so much for joining us. And Laura, I turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Zach, for that introduction. Zach is um, definitely a, a true, he's, he's such an important part of the program. And so thank you for keeping us on track. This is like Zach said, our second six weeks for 2022. What we've been able to do is um, take the best of our partners trainings that they're offering for school board candidates. And that's why we have Dr. Karen Hiltz with us today, who's going to be here presenting on behalf of the Noah Webster Educational Foundation. They have a spectacular training for school board candidates. The Leadership Institute also has a great training and for in so many areas for school board candidates and other candidates. So what I wanted to do in 2022 is really take the best of what I saw from Noah Webster from the Leadership Institute and from our trainings from BEST and put them together in six weeks. Because if, you, you, if you've if you launched your campaign and you're in the middle of your campaign, you're going to have to have some of this basic knowledge to just get you off the ground and get you going um, so that you're ready to go from day one. And uh, so I hope that you get a lot out of this um, six-week series that that we're offering you now. And we have changed the time so that we can try to um, take advantage of, of the individuals that have quiet time at home during the day. So we typically had these at in the evenings, but this year we're trying, trying it with having these during the day. But if you're not able to join us and, and you're watching this recording, thank you for, for jumping on. I know in our first six weeks, our recordings, we had over 100, or I'm sorry, 850 individuals that were able to utilize the trainings um, that weren't live. So thank you for jumping on if, if you're watching this as a recording, but there is benefit to jumping on the Zoom live because you can ask us questions and we can interact with you, but we understand if you can't. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to jump into the basics. What are the basic um, 
parameters that you should understand as a school board candidate or if you're looking at becoming a school board candidate. So we're going to walk you through some of those basics today. Um, let's see if I can get this going here. So uh, our objectives to this training is to give you the ABCs of, of your first steps. Oh, I get this question so many times, so I thought I'd incorporate it into the PowerPoint is time requirements of a school board member. You're gonna learn school board and district specifics that you should know as a school board candidate if you don't already know. Karen is gonna walk us through um, the, the constitutional and statutory authority, roles and responsibilities of school board members. And then also we'll briefly touch on the structure and composition of school boards. Um, so, if you're considering running for school board, what are those first steps? And if you've already filed, congratulations. <laughs> uh, I know that that was a big decision for you. And this is a big decision. This is an important time right now in our, in our country. And this decision that you're making to run for school board is bigger than just you. This, you are really um, protecting this this young generation from all this wokeism that's happening within our school district. So thank you for, for filing and thank you for considering. So what we're gonna look at and what you'll learn through our best academy is we're gonna give you a lot of information, but we're also gonna give you a lot of homework because it's up to you as a candidate to really do your own homework in your local area. We can give you the basics, but it's really up to you to really dive into your local issues, to dive into um, what do the elections look like in your area? What are the dynamics in the politics? So here's some homework assignments that we wanna give you out of the gate week one. If you've not filed, you need to know this. And I, I'm hoping that we have individuals that are on here that are looking at filing in 2023 because those, elect those elections are right around the corner. They'll be here quicker than you even realize it. But how are elections ran in your district? Where do you file your candidacy? What district do you live in? <laughs> and I've had this before. They might think that their, their district is district three, but they actually live in the zoning of district four. So really understand what district you live in. Uh, when does your qualifying begin and end? What is the date of your school board election, which is basic information, but that's something that you need to understand if you're looking at um, mm -hmm. considering running. And is your school board member in your current district reelectable? Now, here's something that we don't wanna do. We do not want to divide our energy. Um, if you live in a district, because we know these elections are so important, these school board elections, we're talking about it, we're trying to motivate parents, we're trying to get people engaged in these elections. But let's say you have a school board that has four um, school board members that aren't fighting for the issues that's important to you. And then you have one lone wolf that's trying to do the job, trying to stand up for what's right for our kids and our, and our parents and our, and our freedoms. And that just so happens to be the, the district you live in. I want you to strongly, strongly, strongly consider not running if that is the case, because what you can do as an individual, you can take that energy that you have that passion that you have, and you can help unseat some of those bad incumbents and help get some other school board members elected to those districts. Because this is about, this should be about making long lasting change. This mm -hmm. should never be about us, right? It's, this should always be about our kids. So that's my suggestion to you. Um, one of the first things that you need to really understand is if you're considering running for school board or if you even have basic questions about your election, you should always go back to your office of elections um, individual. And every state is completely different. <laughs> Most Arizona, the office of elections 
that person is your county recorder. And if you're in Colorado, that's that person's the county elections office in Florida. If you're in Florida, that's the county supervisor of elections office, Georgia county elections office, and so forth. But those first steps to understand what district you live in, uh, what are your filing deadlines, what are your qualifying deadlines, how do you collect your petitions, these are the individuals that are professionals and they can answer those questions. So you need to understand who that, who that person is in your, your local area and always lean on them for that knowledge and information. Um, and then obviously we have some elections that are coming up right around the corner. Uh, we just went through the elections um, in a lot of these states, but we have some new elections coming up this year. We have um, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, and the list goes on. Um, but if your name isn't up there, uh, we do have your election deadlines and your election dates. Just email Zach and we will make sure that you have that. But really what we're trying to do is make, um, make it where you, you go directly to your, your office of elections and, and you build that relationship with them. That is very important. Okay, so I'm always asked because I am a former school board member and Karen's a former school board member and, and you're gonna get different answers from whoever you ask, but um, time requirement of a school board member. Now, what we're always told is it's a part-time job. And, um, and technically it is a part-time job, but it's a full-time commitment. You always, it, you're mm -hmm. going to have to be very flexible with your time when you're a school board member um, because you have events at night, you have events in the morning, you have meetings at night, you might have surprise, special meetings during the day that you weren't planning on. Things come up and you just have to be flexible. Um, but here's another thing about time requirements. The school districts want you to be an absent school board member. I'm gonna tell you that from my personal experience, they want you to be hands off. They mm -hmm. want to do their job because they're the experts. They want to bring you in for an agenda review um, the day before the meeting. And then they want you to rubber stamp everything that they brought to you. Now, when you're looking at that model, you're gonna be less than a part-time school board member, but that is a part of the problem that we're in right now. You're going to have to become more involved and adopt the motto of Ronald Reagan, trust your school administrators, but you're going to have to start verifying everything that they do. And that takes time commitment. So um, I'm going to say, as a former school board member and um, I was also, my last two years, I was the chairman. As a school board member, I'm gonna say, expect to spend at least 15 to 20 hours a week. And this could be dependent, if you're in a district like Miami-Dade, you're gonna spend a lot more time. But as a school board member, would you agree, Karen, 15 to 20 hours? Definitely. <laughs> because you're gonna, you're going to have a lot of research that you're going to have to continuously um, be doing. You're going to have committees that are going to be meeting. You're going to want, you're not going to be involved in those committees because those recommendations are going to be coming to you, but you're going to be doing the same research that these committees are doing so that you're a well-informed school board member when this information does get to you and you, you're able to make a decision based on the research, not the opinions of solely of a committee. We, we appreciate our committees, but we also, it's up to us to do our research as a school board member. So you're gonna have your research time. You're going to have those special meetings that are called. You're gonna have your monthly meetings. You're gonna have your committee meetings. Um, you're gonna have calls from constituents at all hours of the evening, during the day. And that's what I mean, you have to be flexible. And um, where you're gonna spend as a school board member, 
uh, what I found is your springs and early summer was my most, most busiest time as a school board member because you have the end, end of the year celebrations, you have the graduations, you have that's budget time. You have your budget workshops that are happening. You're starting to adopt some new materials coming up for the new school year. So your springtime in the beginning of summer is probably going to be your busiest time as a school board member, and you need to be prepared to be flexible on that. Um, so real, realistically, if someone told you it's only a couple hours a week, um, to be a really good school board member, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna say that's not a true number. So 15 to 20 hours is a good number for you to consider. Okay, even if you have filed, that's that's great, but if you've not filed, this information is for you too. If you have filed, there's basic things that you're gonna have to know as a candidate. Uh, it's basic. If these are basics that are going to come up in conversation and to be an informed candidate, you're going to have to understand what that is. You need to be doing your research and understand what are the biggest issues in your district, what is important to your constituents, what's important to your parents, and what is important to your taxpayers, because you as a candidate might have the issues that are important to you, but you're trying to get elected. And you need to do your research. You need to be talking to your constituents, your parents, your taxpayers, and you need to understand what are those issues that are gonna get you elected? And how can you tie those is issues to your foundation and your principles? That is, that's priority number one, if you are a new candidate to make sure that you can answer those questions. Some of the top issues that we're going to be looking at um, as a, a candidate right now, um, this is always at the top of the list. How's the school district spending their money? Transparency with parents and taxpayers, because if you look at your property tax bill, majority of all your uh, majority of your property tax goes towards the school districts, even if you have kids in school or not, your retirees, this is what really interests them is how's, how's their taxpayer dollars being spent. So this will always be an issue, but also you need to do your research and you got to understand what are those other issues. You can't adopt your platform based on what the national issues are. You got to understand what are the local issues and what are the issues that you can connect with your local voters. And um, that's why it's important that you do your research now. Basic things that you need to understand about your school board um, as a candidate is what is the school district organizational chart? You can always find this, typically you can always find this on your um, school board website. You can under superintendent or most of the time, this is always under superintendent. If it's not under superintendent, you'll find it under the link of school board. But you need to really understand what is the structure of your school district. Because when you're out talking about how the money's being spent or you're top heavy or you don't have enough funding, you need to understand who are all those individuals that are making up the parts and pieces of your local district. Um, so that is, that's a basic that you need to under, you need to do some research on. And also, if your district doesn't have this on their organizational chart, they should. You know, they always have the, the board of education or the school board at the top of the school district organizational chart that they really at the top of the organizational chart is the taxpayers, parents, and the community members, right? Because that's who you as a school board answers to. And I think we've gotten away from that. So we have to remind them. Okay. Other things, uh, basics that you need to know, and then Karen is going to take it away with the, the um, other, other, the legal guidelines and the roles and responsibilities of a school board member. But, and we're going to jump deeper into this in week six 
But these are the basics that you need to start with right now. Familiarize yourself with your school board's budget. Like I said, one of the biggest jobs that you'll have as a school board member is approving contracts, budget, and, um, and you need to get a head start on this. School board camp budgets are probably one of the most complicated budgets in, in government, but it just takes a little time to, for you to invest to really understand some of the basics. Where does your local state, um, where does the funding come from? It's gonna come from your local state, federal. What are those dollar amounts? What is, on average, how much is spent in your area on a child, uh, a student? How much is your, what's the average pay of your teachers in your area? Um, what's your state funding per pupil? Um, and are there any teacher union or association um, budget demands right, right now that they're negotiating? These are some of the, the questions that you're gonna get asked as a candidate. Um, so just be prepared for them. And um, this is what I have found. Karen might have different, <laughs> different areas that people ask questions, but these are some of the areas that I found that when people are talking to you about budget, um, if you know these staples right here, you're gonna be pretty good to go on, on being able to have a conversation. Okay, this is where I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Karen Hills. She is going to be representing the Noah Webster and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, Karen. So you can pop up your screen. Welcome everyone to uh, this presentation. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, some legal guidelines. Because we always, as school boards, as elected uh, representatives in what, whatever capacity, whether it's school boards or anything else, there are legal guidelines that we need to follow. And so let's start with the U.S. Constitution. Everybody knows what the U.S. Constitution is, and I always keep one with me. And the U.S. Constitution is silent when it comes to education. That is a major factor to consider, okay? so. Let's talk a few minutes or a minute about with regards to the federal government. I think we all um, remember from our civics uh, course and stuff that the federal government is made up of three branches, the legislative, which is Article One in the Constitution, and that's the House and the Senate. Then you have the executive, which has um, executive power, and that's the president of the United States. And then you have the judicial, which has um, judicial powers, and that is basically the Supreme Court. And so those are the, the three entities that are involved at the federal level. But like I said, the U.S. Constitution is silent. So why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because when there is a case filed um, at uh, either the state level or the federal level, and it rises all the way up to the uh, Supreme Court of the United States, they will choose to hear some cases. And in those cases, there are three um, amendments that are relevant to education courses, okay? Now, first of all, you have the First Amendment, which is freedom of religion, and that's known as the Establishment Clause. So if you look through court cases, you'll see that um, if there is some type of affiliation with regards to, for example, private going, you want your child to go to a private school and you were denied funding, you were denied some kind of access or something, um, it could be uh, adjudicated based on freedom of religion under the First Amendment. The next amendment is the 10th Amendment, which is states' rights. And, and there are some time, there are some cases where the, courts will bring take it back to or push it back down to the state level because it is dealing more with a state's rights issue versus a federal issue. And then your last, um, basically, uh, uh, higher um, amendment would be 14, which is equal protection. And that's known as the Equal Protection Clause. And that means that you'll find language in those court cases where as long as there is equal protection of the parties involved, then it's constitutional. If not, then it's unconstitutional. So, so that is an, those are some examples um, and the relevance of 
uh, uh, the federal level and their role that they actually play or the part that they get involved in with regards to uh, education cases. So let's go down to the state level. Each state constitution has an article that's titled education. And that's where you will find the structure of how education is to be presented, managed, supported uh, within your state. Now, some states have long articles with regards to education, but there are some states who are, have very minimal sections when it comes to. So it depends on your state. So this is why you need to be familiar with the education article in your state constitution to understand how it's broken down. For example, Louisiana breaks it down as primary education and then higher education. Uh, in the state of Virginia, it's education in general. They do have a, a short section that talks about higher education, but overall they, the constitution relates education as a whole for the state. So there again, that's why it's important. As with the, at the federal level, you've got your legislative, your executive and your judicial, which is identified in each state constitution as well. And remember your legislature, they're the ones who make the laws. Your governors are the ones, are the executive and they um, enforce the laws. And then you've got your judicial, uh, which is your you know, uh, state and local judgeships that interpret the law and give rulings on that. So there again, be familiar with your state constitutions. Now, in some states, it's called state statutes. The next level down is state statutes, or it could be state code. So depending on how your, uh, how your state identifies these is how you'll relate to them. Now, it's important for, again, as the constitution has an article on education, your statutes or code have sections on education as well. And this is where you get more of the meat of how your system is organized, who has authority, who makes decisions with regards to curriculum and funding and uh, just a, a range of things that you deal with with regards to an education system. So it's important for you not only to do the, understand your article, um, the education article in your constitution, but also dive into your statutes or code and understand your role as a school board member from a power and authority and control perspective. Okay, now with regards to education authority, I already stated there's laws, there's statutes, there's code, and then you come down to the local level and this is where you'll find your policy. Now, each layer from from the constitution to the laws, to the statutes, to the policy, they get more detailed, more information. And policy is what you will find when you look at your local school district and you go into what's known as board docs, which is the system that houses um, policies and, and rules and things of that nature for your district. Now, that's where you'll find how your school district will deal with behavior issues. We'll deal with if there's some kind of uh, student dress code policy. Is there some kind of policy with regards to public input? Uh, what is the policy and process with regards to challenging a curriculum, approved curriculum decision? Those are things that you will find locally and you need to also become familiar with those. So a lot of stuff to research. As, as Laura said, research is, very important for you, especially up front. It seems like a lot to learn, but you will become familiar with it and it will, it will um, bode you well to be informed of these things. Now we have departments of education. We have the federal uh, US Department of Education and then you have your state Department of Education. Again, the federal Department of Education to me is basically a data warehouse. Yes, they uh, do put out some information with regards to any federal legislation. And, and the one of the primary federal pieces of legislation I want you to be aware of is what's called IDEA, Individuals with Dis Disabilities in Education Act, IDEA. 
That's where you have children who have disabilities and they have an IEP um, or uh, there's a couple of other elements and aspects with regards to that as well. But that is something that you will have to deal with. So uh, become familiar or at least acknowledge um, that there is the federal law IDEA that you have to comply with. But basically, they, they do manage the student loan program. They do manage um, some other aspects with regards to grants uh, for, uh, from a national perspective. But as I see the Federal Department of Education, it's basically a data warehousing because that's where you go to get the national test scores, to get um, all kinds of information with regards to the states and what they're reporting back that is uh, mandated by the federal department. Now the State Department of Education does that too. They gather data, but they also are more engaged with the local. Uh, in some states, they have greater authority. In some states, they have less authority. So there again, it's incumbent upon you to know that structure and that, and that as from a statutory perspective. Um, they, they administer programs. Some states will identify the curriculum that's to be adopted. Other states will allow the local districts to do that. Um, there is funding uh, that comes from or through the Department of Education. Uh, there's, they also do grants and stuff. So, so there again, just become familiar with who has the authority, what role do they play and make sure that you are complying with uh, what, uh, what your state is requiring. Then we have, <clears throat> oh, I want, well, we would like for you to check out the Noah Webster Educational Foundation. Um, with regards to your state system, there is a link on the website that will take you to your state and it does provide links to all of these uh, pieces of information that I'm sharing with you today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let me see, what, what do we have here? So, <clears throat> so school boards, uh, they do get their authority. Okay, they do have their authority. You need to understand where it comes from. You also need to um, know, who, well, I'll go into that in the next um, session. But then uh, you can read here that uh, we'll talk a little bit more with regards to um, the local school boards and what they actually do. So let's stop sharing this. And Zach, <laughs> I hope I hope I can get this next one correct. We'll get it this time. Okay. So oh I do I need to optimize for video clip? We'll stop share this one for now. Okay. How oh stop share. Stop share. Okay. All right, share the next one as you did this first one. Okay. No, this is the same one. Okay, well, let me close that one then. How's that? Maybe because I had both of them open, that maybe that made a difference. It. Yeah. There we go. Well, I don't All know. Right, perfect. Click on slideshow at the top. Okay. Play from start. Play from start. Okay. Ha. All right. Well, that's much better. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's see what we've got here. Here is the local and state. Here's local versus state boards. I, in, in the Noah Webster training, we do differentiate between the two of those. But today I will just talk about the local school boards and I won't go into the state boards. Okay, how do I move forward? There we go. Okay, we're gonna talk about local. Okay, I know I'm going fast here, but in the essence of time, um, I know we're only supposed to do an hour and the last time we went over an hour. So I wanna be more mindful of the time that we are uh, sharing. And of course, always, feel free to ask questions, uh, email questions to Zach, and uh, we will definitely get an answer back for you, okay? So <clears throat> who are local boards responsible to? We'll talk about these things. Um, what is the role? And then of course, 
what positions serve within a school board. First of all, your local school board, as Laura pointed out, is, you know, you're responsible to the people who elected you to the constituents. And you, you, yes, you do have state authority and you do have a constitutional duty uh, for the education of students. Most consti state constitutions will have some language that says, that the school system is to provide a quality education or something along that lines. So there, there is the constitutional responsibility to um, um, ensure that your, uh, your population is provided an education. So what does a local school board do? One of the things they do is that they approve the policy. Now, they don't always write the policy, Sometimes they will collaborate with the superintendent to come up with uh, some nuances that are particular to the school district. But as a general rule, a lot of policy is created by an external entity. For example, in Virginia, which is where I served, there is the Virginia School Board Association and all states have a school board association. And that arm, is, has a legal team and they are the ones who take the legislation once it's passed and signed by the governor, they will take that legislation and they will work with the Department of Education and with the local school boards to ensure that the policy, the statutes and the policy are legally sound. So there's a bunch of lawyers that are typically involved and or, or some kind of association or organization with regards to ensuring that your um, policy uh, is sufficient, it's followed, and that um, it gets approved by your school board. One of the major uh, responsibilities of the school board is to hire and fire the superintendent. They hold educational authority. They hold fiduciary responsibility for funding, meaning that they are responsible. They are the ones who get presented the budget. They are the ones who make decisions on where the budget is um, to be allocated, I'll say. The superintendent provides recommendations, but it's the school board who actually approves it. So you have that fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayer for that. And then from my perspective, um, not all school board members uh, agree with this, but from my perspective, the school board is to lead the strategic plan development. Superintendents will always provide some kind of goal-oriented plan. Well, that's fine. I mean, we need to have goals to work towards and stuff, but you've got to have a high-level strategic plan, those three to five buckets where you want your resources, all your resources, whether it be human resources, uh, financial resources, um, bus resources, whatever, you want them to be focused towards accomplishing this strategy over a period of time. Now, some look at five-year strategic plan, some look at 10, but still, the, in my mind, the school board should do the overall strategic plan, and then the superintendent should come in with the, the under, underlying elements that support that. So just food for thought there. What are the positions within the school board? Well, you always have a chair and you have a vice chair and you have a clerk of the board. And where I served, we also had a vice clerk of the board. Now, we didn't see the vice clerk of the board too often because the clerk of the board was always there for the most part. Um, but in the division that uh, I served, we did have a um, vice clerk as well that we allocated annually um, or identified annually, I should say. Then there were subcommittee assignments. These may be applicable. You'll find that in your larger school districts, such as uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, Loudoun County, Virginia, Miami-Dade, they will have subcommittees or committees that they will, um, each, each school board member will have a choice to be able to participate in and stuff. It could be looking at an issue with regards to behavior. It could be looking at parental engagement. Uh, but whatever your school district needs, you could have the opportunity or, or probably have the opportunity to be on a committee or subcommittee. Uh, so be aware of that. And those things that are of interest, please, please 
participate and give your two cents worth for sure. Do your research. Legal and professional standards. Yes, we do have those. <laughs> a school board <clears throat> has, you know, a legal um, authority. And there again, as I mentioned previously, it does vary by state. So there again, I'm going back and I'm reiterating, know your constitution, know your statutes and know your policy, okay? So what do you need to know about? There again, your constitution, your statutes and your policy. And I know I'm being repetitive with regards to some of this information, but it's so very important for you to understand. And as Laura said, again, do your homework, do your research, know what you're looking at, because you, those, these are the guiding areas that give you that information. And it's incumbent upon you to know it. The other, another thing that's relevant to um, school boards or all board, all government boards actually is the Roberts Rules of Order. And I'm sure probably many of you have heard about them. But this is, these are the parliamentary procedures uh, that government boards and government entities will operate under. It involves a formal process with regards to how to conduct a meeting and how things may or may not be organized. So please get a copy, one of the, the um, revised copies of Robert's Rules of Order and become familiar with that. When you become a school board member and you become the chair of that school board, you will be the one that will have to follow and, and ensure and instruct that these rules of order are being applied. So there again, prepare yourself. Now, this is one of my favorite things to talk about with regards to school boards is qualifications, because there's so much misinformation out there with regards to what qualifies me as a school. Yeah, I want to run for school board, but what qualifies me as a school board member? Do I have to be a former employee? Do I have to have a doctorate degree in education? Do I have to have lived in, you know, the, the district for all of my life? And the answer to all of those is no. Requirements for school board candidates, again, vary by state with regards to you have to be a resident with, and it's usually a year or two years. In many cases, you have to be a, a voting resident, registered voter and a resident. But I will share with you that one of the things that many people say is that you need to be familiar with education. And I'm here to tell you that, no, you do not have to have had worked for the school system. You do not have to be a former teacher or a retired administrator or a retired superintendent. What you need to be to qualify to run for a local school board is you need to have an interest and concern with regards to the education system that you want to participate in. I personally believe that if you run people who are from within the system, you will only perpetuate the status quo. And so therefore, I'm not a real advocate for having a school board that is totally um, elected former um, sc school system employees. I think we need a mix. I think we need some business professionals. Um, I think we need some medical professionals. I think it would be nice to have a uh, parent representatives, parents who have raised children, who actually know what it's like to deal with a system, to deal with curriculum and things of that nature. So, so there again, if you have an interest in running for school board, you believe that you have skills and talents that are applicable, then by all means, consider running. Okay. And we've already mentioned that, that you don't need an education degree to qualify. Now, there are probably more reasons to run for school board than I could ever count, but here's a few of them for you. You have a passion. That's one of the reasons why I ran for school board is because I have a passion for improving the quality edu of education for the children in not only the district and the state, but across the country, because I think we need some improvement. 
Maybe you're disgruntled about something that your school board did. And so you want to change the outcome. You want to reverse those decisions or you want to, you know, further those. Maybe you're maybe you're very happy with the outcomes and you want to further them or expand upon them. That's another reason. You've recognized that there's a need for improvement. I think I think the last couple of years have really opened the eyes of parents and, and communities with regards to Yes, we do need improvement. We do need to be more concerned about what our children are being taught. Maybe you're thinking about running for higher office down the road and sitting on a, a local school board can be a stepping stone if you aspire to those. Excuse me, maybe you wanna have influence within your community. Being an elected official within your community uh, will elevate you to a position of influence. And so you need to be, in my opinion, you need to be wise, you need to be discerning, and uh, there also needs to be an element of humility with regards to the influence that you can wield. And there, uh, like I said, there's an array of other aspects uh, for people deciding to run. Now, who influences school board members? Well, I always like to look at it as there's some inside influencers and there's some outside influencers. And, and from within, you've got obviously the, the policies, the legislation and all that kind of stuff. The superintendent tries to influence school board members for an array of reasons. But I want you to understand that the superintendent works for the school board, not the other way around. Too many school districts the, the, the school board members get elected, they, they sit on that dais and they just regurgitate what the superintendent is telling them. You need to be able to be an informed decision maker, which requires the research, and you need to be able to think for yourself and make, make common sense, uh, reasonable um, decisions. The employees try to try to give some influence. They'll share stories with you. They'll they'll provide information to you, and so the, you've got the employees who are. And then, of course, you've got the students that uh, are within the school system, and you'll interface with them if you go to the events and participate in some of the school functions and stuff. Okay. Now, from outside, the some of the people that you need to listen to the most. <laughs> as I'm sure many would agree, is the parents, because the parents know the children. Now, you have to understand, though, as a school board member, you are elected and you are representing all the constituents within your district, but you're never going to be able to satisfy all parents and all constituents. <clears throat> so that's why it's important to know what issues are important to you and stand on your foundation. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. What about education associations? I mentioned the school board associations. There's also superintendents associations. You're going to have other county officials. If you, you're going to have your county commissioners or county supervisors, you're going to have the municipalities, your city councils. They're going to try to influence you. Um, and so, and depending on the state that you're in, for example, in Virginia, our, our funding came from through our board of supervisors, our county level government. School boards did not, do not in Virginia have funding authority. It's not the same in every state. So you need to be aware of that as well. Now, also, I always prided myself on building relationships with state officials as well. Who is my state representative? Who is my state senator? I also had conversations with my state department of education. If I had a question about something that my superintendent was telling me, then I would call up and double check and say, okay, um, your director or uh, the head of, uh, of curriculum I have this question. This is what I was told. Can you verify this? Can you clarify whatever the, the need is? But don't be afraid to reach out to your Department of Education. And then, of course, you've got a range of uh, interested parties. Uh, they can, as you can see, they can range from safety to school choice. Uh, the unions uh, are in every state, whether you're a union state or a right to work state. Union influence is in every state. So be mindful of that as well. 
<clears throat> now, how do how do local school board meetings work? How do they run? What what do you actually do in a local school board meeting? <clears throat> well, one of the things that they do on an annual basis is they vote on their annual schedule. Uh, some school divisions have once a month meetings. Some of them have twice a month meetings. Some of them hold, hold uh, a period of time on the calendar for special meetings for certain occasions and things of that nature. So they will approve, uh, uh, propose and approve an annual schedule. Uh, your meetings, uh, like I said, you have to follow the Roberts Rules of Order. Uh, chairman of the board, they run the meeting, um, but they don't have any special authority when it comes to voting. Each member gets one vote, regardless of whether you're the chair, the vice chair, it does, it's irrelevant. Each member gets one vote. So be mindful of that as well. You typically have the business meeting and then you'll have special meetings. There's a difference with regards to those, the purpose and the intent, and with regards to public input as well. Public input is done at business meetings. It's typically not done at special meetings. And the public has to be notified that a meeting is taking place. So there are uh, public notice requirements. So, ma so many days prior to a meeting, uh, you have to identify where the meeting is being held, what, what day, time, and those kinds of things have to be presented to the public. Now, there's a debate going on in some states as to what is public notification, uh, because technology has uh, made an impact with regards to the ability to do that. So do they actually need to put it in the local newspaper or is just posting it online ac acceptable? So those are some that's another issue that is being discussed and debated in certain states around the country as well. So who participates in meetings? Well, you've got your board members, you've got your superintendent, and usually they bring some staff with them. Uh, their human resources director, their chief of finance, their chief of curriculum, uh, depending on how large or small your, your staff is, then that will depend on the roles and responsibilities of those staff and when they participate and when they don't. But typically you'll find that your uh, operations, chief of operations, your chief financial officer and your chief uh, um, human resources director, those are three very um, high level relevant uh, staff members that the superintendent has that participates in pretty much the majority of the business meetings. And then again, you have your board clerk that the board clerk is responsible for ensuring that that the minutes are uh, taken, they're accurate. Some boards will record meetings, uh, some will video and record meetings, and that is becoming more and more the norm rather than just taking notes and stuff nowadays. So, and then of course, during public comment period, uh, residents can. Now, one of the things I need to you need to be mindful of is that when you have public input, it is an opportunity for the public to speak. You do not interact with the public during public input, okay? So when you're up there, regardless of what the public is saying to you, whether it's positive or negative, you don't react, you don't comment, you don't give feedback, you just listen, okay? And then there's something also called closed meetings and open meetings. And there is a, a little bit of a difference, obviously, <clears throat> with regards to those. Oops, I went too far. Uh, closed meetings are identified by statute. And closed meetings were, as a general rule, but in, for Virginia in particular, closed meetings were that way because they weren't to be held in public because they were dealing with either staff or student discipline problems, behavioral problems, or there were land acquisition issues. Now I know that, that there are more than, there's a couple more things that can be put into a closed meeting and stuff, but generally my experience lends to those two elements. So there again, go back to your statutes, and identify what is involved with regards to a closed meeting. And a closed meeting means you're not doing it in public, the doors are closed, there's no recordings, there's no minutes, there's, it's, it's closed, okay? Now, after the closed meeting, we would come back into open session 
And we would, if there was a vote to be taken, then we would take the vote. We would just identify that, that we had a discussion and that here is the vote, okay? But with regards to open meetings, those are for the public. They're the business meetings, they're the, the special meetings. If, you, if a, a, your board decides to hold a special meeting because of the curriculum, then the public are entitled to go there to listen. Uh, here in Florida, they actually do online. So you can actually view online rather than going to the, uh, the school district and uh, participating or sitting in and stuff. So, so there again, be mindful of closed meetings and the relevance and the importance of um, having some privacy for uh, those statutory elements, but then everything else is open meetings and it's supposed to be transparent and the public is allowed to observe and give their public input during that period of time. So if you wanna learn more about school boards, uh, Noah Webster has a, a, a section or a training session on state boards. And um, I just ask you to continue to take a stand, uh, run for those school board positions, do some good things and um, we can uh, all work on this together and, and have some real relevant and positive outcomes. So thank you very much. I believe that's it. Yes, it is. Stop share. All right. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Hiltz. Um, that was great. I think uh, we got a lot of good information uh, barring uh, any technical issues, which technology can be very uh, finicky. Um, so for all of you, I saw there were some questions while we were talking about how to access the PowerPoints and the recording. Uh, I will be sending out an email to all registrants, and that includes everyone who is attending currently, with a link on where you can access both the recording and the slides that were used uh, during uh, this presentation. Um, I also want to mention that at 7.30 p.m. tonight, uh, BEST is hosting its uh, Parents Exposing the Culture Wars in the Classroom uh, second session. Uh, in that webinar series. This is great useful information for anyone interested in running for school board and parent activists in general. Today's topic is going to be reclaiming the role of the parent. Uh, and I think it would be nice to have school board members who accept and respect the role of parents in education. So if you're free at 7.30 p.m. tonight, uh, or if you're interested in getting access to the recording of that session, please register and I am sending the link to access that in the chat right now. So thank you both, uh, Laura and Dr. Hiltz again. Um, I really am looking forward to uh, this series. And uh, I hope uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send me an email uh, or respond directly to the email that I will be sending uh, in just a few hours here. So thank you, everyone. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Oh,